I think it's high time that I sew up another version of this vintage sleeveless 1950s pattern that I'm wearing right now. It's a mail order pattern. Editor Tasha just discovered I'm wearing two different earrings. Which are the kind of patterns that used to be advertised in magazines and newspapers. It's marked as Printed Patterns 9005. I imagine it's probably an Ann Adams or a Marion Martin pattern, although I don't have the original envelope and I couldn't source anything online to confirm. It's a really cute pattern though with three views, and the one that I'm making has this yoke over the shoulders that kind of forms a curved cap sleeve with open armholes faced with bias tape. And you can watch my latest video tutorial on how to do bias tape perfectly around armholes every time. I'll link it in the description. When I did a muslin of this top when I originally sewed this version, I only made two adjustments. I lowered the bust arts, which I always need to do, and I added some width at the side seams for the hips. And I was happy with how those adjustments worked out, so I'm not going to make any adjustments on this version. Except construction. I think I'm going to make a minor change that will result in a nicer finish for an area where I was a little bit unhappy about with this version, but we'll talk about that when I get there. Let's get to it! Kicking things off here by cutting out the fabric. This is a random poly cotton gingham from my stash. I'll be honest, I rarely pay attention to cutting layouts given in patterns, in part because I'm often planning to line up a print, and I can't use given layouts for that since I'm almost always cutting out on a single layer of fabric. I did debate actually cutting this top out on the fold since it's a small enough print and I wasn't going to really bother matching it up in too many places, but I decided to anyway. I did give it some thought how I wanted to deal with the gingham at the center front. It's really helpful to step back from your fabric to decide what you like best for the center front and center back line on a vertical print. I decided I liked the white down the center line since it balances the two stripes on either side, which is typically my decision, although all prints with vertical lines are different of course. The other thing I debated was did I want the yoke on the bias or straight grain, and ultimately after consulting the previous one I did and lining things up and sort of just trying to visualize what it would look like with the yoke on the bias, I decided on the straight grain. This top also needs bias tape, so I cut that out next. It's super easy with this quilting ruler that I have, it's clear and it has a 45 degree angle already marked on it, so I just had to turn it to the 45 degree angle line and cut a one inch strip for each armhole. Then it was time to interface the yoke pieces. I unfortunately never made a page for the past version of this top in my sewing journal. Naughty naughty, I know. <laughs> so while I was pretty sure I'd interface just the outer yoke pieces and not the facings too, I wasn't completely sure. But that's what I decided to do for this version since it seemed like the most likely option. And this time I'll make sure to make a page for this version in my journal. I'll also link to my video on my sewing journal in the description. One thing I forget about 50% of the time when I'm sewing is to not mark the pieces I'm going to interface until after I've interfaced, but haha, -ha, I remembered this time. For the front and back yoke pieces of this pattern, you clip one set of notches to the seam line, so I marked that after interfacing the pieces. Next up, I made a half an inch bias tape for facing the armholes using a little bias tape maker, easy peasy, and then off to prep the darts. This is a top with double-ended darts, so it narrows at your waist, but then increases back for your high hip, as you can see in the pattern. I did my usual prepping of all the darts to sew them in one go, plus I did the same thing with the shoulder seams of both the outer yoke and yoke facing pieces, so that's a whole lot of things to pin and then sew at one time, but batching makes it all go a little bit faster for me. And I realized when I talk about batching darts like this, I never include the bust darts. While I could technically pin the waist darts and the bust darts at the same time, if there's a way to stab myself with pins pointing in different directions, I most certainly will. So I just do all the waistline darts first, and then I follow up with the bust darts after. Then after all the darts and shoulder seams were done, I pressed them all. And then used fusible stay tape along the left edge of both the bodice front and back because there's a side zipper. And if I'm doing a side zipper for a top like this, I have to decide if I want to interface before sewing the dart or after. It's a little unconventional maybe, but I usually opt for after. So yeah, I'm just applying stay tape right over a pressed bust dart on the front here. It's a little hard to apply for the top since there's that curve in for the waist between the bust and the hip, but I go a couple of inches at a time, giving it a quick light press to secure it and kind of curve around as I go. And then once I've curved it all into position and lightly pressed it, I give it all a good press to fully secure it like normal. Then I serge the raw edges of just the left side of the bodice pieces. And then since I didn't have a short enough zipper, I shortened that up before starting in on the lapped side zipper. 
Okay, so my zipper is shortened and I'm ready to install it and I'm gonna leave the right side open. So I'm actually going to install this zipper in a different way than I usually do on blouses, just because I think <laughs> this, is, this way is closer to how I actually do this on dresses. So I'll close up the side seam to the top of the zipper stop, which will be at the top, because obviously this opens from the bottom. And then I'm going to press the seam allowance under 5 eighths of an inch on the front bodice, press it half an inch on the back bodice, because I'm doing a lap zipper, of course, because that's what I always do. And then I will sew the right side of the zipper tape to the back bodice and then top stitch the front. I'll also have to kind of keep in mind where I want the tab to end so that uh, it falls above the hem. I, honestly, like I just, I don't really even care that much. Um, <laughs> here's, here's a different blouse that I did. Don't mind that this is completely wrinkly because it just came out of the laundry. But in this blouse, the tab hangs free like below the bottom of the blouse, but you know, I, I don't really care. But you know, for this one, I'll try for accuracy and there's a little five eighths inch hem for this blouse and I will try and have the tab and just above that, you know, something like that. So we'll see. So off to press the side seams for that lap zipper. I took a couple of clips into the seam allowance since there's no way I could really get the seam allowance pressed into that side seam curve. Otherwise, it doesn't have to lay perfectly flat before sewing the zipper, but it does help a little bit to do that. Then I had to sew the left side of the bodice shut down to the zipper stop, which is only a couple of inches down from the armhole. Okay, so I have the blouse closed up to the top of the zipper on the left side, and now I need to remark my hem seam allowance because that marker gets removed with the iron. So I'll just give that a little mark again to remember it, which in this print is about, uh, let's see, two and a half squares from the bottom. Kind of like working with ginghams and plaids, you get <laughs> horizontal and vertical lines sometimes to, uh, to note things on. So I need to, uh, I need to get pins is what I need to do. Let's get some pins. Okay, and I will pin the left side of the, well, right side, it's upside down, so technically the left side, but <laughs> right side for this orientation. Pin the right side of the zipper to the back bodice. Now, like I said, I wanna make sure that my tab is, I don't know, a little bit above that hem. It doesn't It doesn't super matter, like I said. I don't really care that much, but going for a little bit above this time. And just need to pin this in along the back. And this shouldn't be too difficult because I clipped a couple curves into the side because I knew that this was a fairly curved bodice around the hips. So I need to make sure that the fabric will lay smoothly. I will say that doing a zipper on a top is a little harder to wrap my brain around since it's not left and right side, it's front and back. But once the right side of the zipper slash back side of the bodice is pinned, then I sew that on with a zipper foot. I'm so used to sewing dresses with center back zippers that it always feels a bit funny starting a zipper upside down like this. Okay, so the next thing is I will top stitch the blouse front to the back, but I, um, I like to do that with my walking foot. And so <laughs> when I do that, the zipper tab, no matter whether it's at the bottom or the top, will be in the way. And so this is just a weird, this is just a personal strange little thing that I do to help me top stitch with my walking foot is I tie a loop of thread to the zipper, through the zipper because then when I get to it, I can flatten it and then pull it free of my walking foot because I cannot get my fingers underneath my walking foot to actually do that like you would with a zipper foot or something to move it out of the way. So that's just a little kind of quirky thing that I do, but it works out nicely for me. So on to pinning for the top stitching. So then I just pin the left side of the zipper tape to the front of the bodice to top stitch in place next. And like I said, I like to use my walking foot for this, which is kind of a weird place to use it. So when I get to the end of this, you can see what I do with that little loop of thread through the zipper tab to pull it out of the way. Most people would just use a zipper foot for this and not fuss with this. I don't know. I just tend to get a straighter line this way. 
though it's probably been four or more years since I've tried it with a zipper foot, so maybe I should try it again and see what I think. Just because you use a method doesn't mean you need to stay married to it. So after pressing the zipper, it was time to close up the other side of the bodice, so just need to pin the right side of the bodice, sew that seam, give it a good press, and then finish the raw edges with my serger. And then we move on to the armholes. So next up on this is the bias facing on the armhole. And so I'm doing bias tape, and you can see my previous version here, how this looks, and the armhole is just open below the shoulder, like so. And the pattern calls for a one and a half inch bias strip, just sewed along the normal 5 eighths inch seam allowance, and then trimming that and all that. But what I actually do is I just make bias tape, and then I trimmed my pattern piece, and then made a note to remember that I did this. I trimmed the seam allowance to a quarter of an inch, so I'm just gonna do bias tape instead at a quarter inch seam allowance. Just saves, I don't know, a couple steps. Bias facing works just as well, so you know, whatever your preference is, I kinda tend to prefer to use bias tape, so that's what I'm gonna do here. So all I need to do is apply the bias tape to the armholes, but I'm not going to go into that in depth in this video because I just did a tutorial on my favorite two easy tricks to get perfectly smooth bias tape facings around an armhole curve, where you can watch me go through that step by step. I'll link that tutorial in the description. But what I did here was a pretty typical application of bias tape as a facing. I sewed it on with my quarter inch seam allowance that I trimmed my pattern pieces down to for the armhole areas, as I mentioned, and then after clipping the curves, I pressed and folded the bias tape to the inside of the bodice and top stitched it down. Sometimes I sew this by hand if it's a bit fancier of a top, but this one is a casual summer top, plus the yoke will be top stitched too, so top stitching it is. Then I clipped off the ends of the bias tape at the edge of the armholes and we are finally moving along to the yoke. First the easy stuff before we get to the hard stuff. In order to get the yoke ready to sew to the bodice, you close up the upper neckline edge. So I pinned the inside of the donut as it were, and then sewed that seam. I trimmed and graded the neckline, and then clipped the curves, which, you know, is basically the entire thing. Then I understitched it and pressed. And then the hard part begins. Even knowing what I meant to do, which is pin the lower edge of the yoke to the upper edge of the bodice on both the front and back, I still stood around for a few minutes trying to figure out which way to turn all the pieces to make sure I was pinning the correct side of everything and leaving the facings free. And frankly, I just stood there staring at the instructions a lot too. But eventually I got it sorted out and pinned the upper bodice seam to the yoke on the front and back and sewed those two seams. The stopping point for sewing those seams is that notch the pattern has you clipped to the seam line that I mentioned earlier, which I realized I overshot by a little bit on one side, so I unpicked that and re-sewed that little bit before moving on. So I have attached the yoke to the bodice on both the front and the back between the armholes and the shoulders are free. And this is, and this is so weird to try and look at this because the facings are free. This is the yoke, the facing of the yoke is free. You can see kind of how the bodice will take shape if I fold that down um, like so. So the next step, is where this gets kind of like eh, wonky. Um, you basically, you baste and turn under the free edge of the facing, you press up the seam allowances of the bodice, and you baste and turn under the free edge of the yoke that's left on the outer part, basically to form the shoulder. So the pattern, while it has you trim and grade the seam allowances for the for part of the neckline, it does not have you do that for this lower one. And I know when I made the blue version, I was kind of unhappy with how bulky this seam allowance was between the two different yoke pieces. So what I've been thinking I'm going to do, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days, is I'm going to trim down the seam allowances to a quarter of an inch on the lower edge of the facing piece of the yoke and then also the outer piece of the yoke, both trim it along the bodice that I've already sewed and then press that up. I'll probably clip it a couple of spots, although that's relatively not too curved there. And then the same thing here. So, cause you know, turning under a 5A seam lounge, I mean, you know, you can kind of see that like, you're gonna turn that under and it's gonna get a little bit wavy cause there's, there's more fabric um, 
than the uh, than you know like what it's folding back to and so that's that's why i felt like those seam allowances were kind of bulky on my other version so i think if i pre-trim that all to a quarter of an inch it'll make it easier i mean it will make it kind of you know a little fussy to turn under a quarter of an inch and a quarter of an inch and sew that all perfectly but i think i think that that's what i'm going to do i've been thinking about this for a while and um you know, it'll uh, work well or it won't work well. But the other method wasn't particularly great, so I figure it can only improve from here. So we'll see. I decided that the easiest way to handle that was to baste along the 5 8 inch seam line first and then trim down the seam allowance to about a quarter of an inch. It meant I had the seam line accurate first, so I didn't have to be as accurate with my trimming. Then I pressed under the basted seam allowance on both the entire yoke basing and the free edges of the outer yoke that formed the little cap sleeve shoulder deal. As I suspected, that was a lot easier to do with the narrower seam allowance, so I'm really glad I trimmed it down. And now for the part that I dreaded all along, closing up the yoke, which invariably involves a seam ripper at least once if you're me. <laughs> you pin the facing down to cover the seam line on the bodice front and back, and then pin together the yoke shoulders and edge stitch that all to close the yoke from the right side, trusting all the while that you're catching the facing the whole time. And no matter how meticulous I am, unless it's a simple shape like a plain waistband, I can almost guarantee that when I do this, I'll miss a section of the facing and need to redo it, which is predictably exactly what happened here. Thankfully, only a small section. I count my lucky stars because this yoke is so annoying to assemble. I'd forgotten that since I had sewn it previously, so I think I'll be leaving myself a new note to that effect this time. But finally, etch stitching was complete, even though I almost threw this in the naughty corner when I discovered I had to redo that one part. <laughs> After the yoke was closed up, I just unpicked any visible bits of basting stitches that could be seen from the outside of the fabric. And then all that's left is the narrow hem. This is a 5 8 inch hem turn up, so I pressed it along the hemline, carefully since there's a bit of a curve to this, and then turned in the narrow hem and pinned it before edge stitching it. Now I don't know if the way I do lap side zippers on a top is exactly standard, but you can see how the end of the zipper looks on both sides. Pretty nice and tidy if you ask me. And not too bad when it's closed either. I love how this top turned out. I'm so glad I trimmed the seam allowances down on the upper bodice seams, unlike my previous version. It made such a difference in terms of not making that seem too bulky. And as much as I complained bitterly while pinning, shut, and edge stitching and unpicking the yoke, it really is such a lovely result. As soon as I tried this on, I thought, oh yeah, that was all worth it, though it never feels like that at the time. If you enjoy watching me sew projects, check out one of these two videos. And about that note I was going to leave myself regarding the yoke, see you soon for more vintage sewing. Bye.